Okay, so we're recording this so that we can put it up on Blackboard for people to see. And uh, hopefully you can see the screen share okay. Um, so I'm using my camera to uh, go onto a different screen. So you can't see me on Zoom, but you should be able to see me on the screen share. Uh, okay, so I did that. Hope you've had a nice weekend. Hope you enjoyed uh, the first week of process control with Dr. Costas. I'm Peter Martin, and I'm going to look after the next um, four weeks of control and then the final week as well. So Costas and I are sharing the module uh, this semester. Um, so we put up material last week um, for this week. So the main thing we have is Laplace transforms. There was a bunch of videos which were looking at those revising what you probably have seen already but might have forgotten a bit of and um, Laplace transforms are pretty central to control as we teach it um, so you need to be au fait with all of that. So in this review I'm going to um, look at the three main points that uh, I think are covered in the material that we've got and then we'll break up uh, into groups so that we can then look at some of the problems that were listed for this week. Uh, the problems for this week were just all the class transform examples, just to make sure that we're all sorted on that. I can see in the chat people are telling me how to turn the doorbell off, um, but uh, I don't want to do that right now. I'm just going to crack on with the material and we'll cope. Okay, so what's all this about? Uh, process control. We are interested in some system. And so typically we're interested in some system, something's uh, coming into the system. We've got some inputs and we've got some outputs and we're going to characterize our system. And process control is all about the behavior of this. And in particular, it's about the behavior of this uh, as it relates to disturbances um, and making the system respond the way we want it to when there is a disturbance. And the reason why we're looking at the PLAS transforms, which is what we're doing when we're writing it in S like this, is that they can do a few really useful things for us which is easier than doing it in the time domain. And perhaps the first thing that they do is that we can write the basic behavior of the system as ys is equal to gs times fs. So if we know what the input is and we know what the uh, characteristic um, uh, system behavior is, then we have a neat way of predicting the behavior of the system. And so this is the key part of it which we call a transfer function. So we want to be able to deal with transfer functions comfortably. We want to be able to understand inputs and how to represent them. We want to be able to understand how to then go from the Laplace domain back to the time domain so that we can see actually how the system behaves in real life. So there are a few elements to that that we are going to just revise today and look over to make sure that you're familiar with it all. So the first one we're gonna do is about the input um, and to make sure that we've done an example of uh, Laplace transform so that we can see the basic methods for doing that. Uh, so we've got the input which we described as uh, F of S in the last one. So in the time domain, we have some input so this is something that's going into the system that's changing with time. Um, it's not steady state. And I'm gonna pick an example, which is uh, not one that we've done before in the mini lecture videos. So if we have time and we have the function f of t, uh, we could pick something simple like f of t is equal to a t squared. So whatever we've got is increasing with time and it's increasing uh, with time to the power two. 
Um, and we want to uh, just make sure that we know how to represent that as a Laplace transform. Obviously, there are two ways of doing that. You can look at tables to see if you can spot it, um, but we want you to be able to be confident at deriving them using the definition. So here we're going to derive it with the definition and, um, and uh, then we're going to uh, just see how you can actually do that with the table more quickly. So we want the Laplace transform of our function. You'll have seen in the videos, you write Laplace transform as a curly L, square brackets represent um, what we're doing it to. And then we put our function inside. And the definition for most purposes is the integral from zero to infinity of your function, which is AT squared in this case, multiplied by the special term E to the minus ST DT. I'll be integrate that and that gives us the transfer, uh, the transform. Okay, so uh, we've got a term here. It's got two bits in it. So we're gonna be looking at uh, integrating by parts. So if we let u is equal to t squared, that would make du is equal to 2t. And if we let dv equal to e to the minus st, then v would be minus e to the minus st over s. And we can then plug those into our equation. Take the factor a out. Uh, and then we've got the term uv at the beginning. So this is integrating u dv is equal to uv not to infinity minus the integral of v du. So now we've got v du, so du is two times t. And then we've got v, which is minus something about a plus, e to the minus st over s. And that's all multiplied by a. Okay, so we uh, want to work through this. So we can see again already, we're gonna to have to do integration by parts again here. Um, this term, so let's see what happens to that. When t is infinity, we've got e to the minus t function here. So if t is infinity, that's a zero. Uh, when t is zero, we've got a t squared term here. So that's going to be zero. So this whole term is just equal to zero. And we only need to deal with this part. So we're gonna do integrating by parts again on that. This time, we're going to say u is equal to t and so du is equal to 1. dv is equal to e to the minus st again and so v again is equal to minus e to the minus st over s. Put that in once more. Uh, we've got some new constants here so we've got a and 2 divided by s left over from before. Now we've got uh, u and v, so u is t, v is minus e over s, e to the minus st over s, naught to infinity, minus our integral. And our integral now is uh, the u is one, v is minus e to the minus st over s dt. Okay, so we check this term again. Again, this is going to be zero because we've got e to the minus st, that's infinity, we'll make that zero. t will be zero when that's zero. So again, that's zero. So we've got two a, we'll take that s out. So we've got s squared Uh, and now we need to integrate this term. So that's going to be e to the minus st divided by minus s naught to infinity. And we're almost there. 
put infinity in and then e to the minus infinity is zero. And so we're going to have uh, put naught in, then that term will be one. So we're going to have um, uh, minus, so 2a over s squared, zero minus one over minus s, uh, which is obviously equal to um, two a over s cubed. Okay, so there's an example of finding the Laplace transform by doing the integration two a over s cubed. Um, that's doable for many regular common functions, but um, we can often do it faster as well by using tables. So these are the tables that you'd typically get in an exam here. Um, and you're just given lots of functions and what the transform is. So if you're working on a problem, you can look for something that is similar to what you've got. Uh, see if there's a form that you can represent it in that's matched by these. So here we've got great focus. Worse. Uh, that's t to the power n, and here's its Laplace transform. So t to the power n will suit us well. We're looking for a t squared. So t to the n can be represented uh, when n is two. And so when n is equal to two, so the Laplace transform of t to the n is equal to, from the tables it's uh, here, is equal to n factorial divided by s n plus one. And so we could have done this straight away. We've got a t squared. So let's make uh, an a there. Let's make n equal to two. And so then our Laplace transform would have been a two factorial is equal to two divided by s cubed. Same as what we had before. So you can see there that um, the tables can be so much faster than doing the integration yourself. Um, if you're doing an exam, then obviously you need to pay attention to the, what the exam asks you to do. If it's wanting you to demonstrate the ability to do an integration, then obviously do it that way. Otherwise you're welcome to use tables to get there faster. What does this mean? Well, once we've got the expression, we can use that. So uh, in this case here, we have got uh, a problem where we're trying to find an output maybe. Um, and so we need to know what the input is and we need to know what the transfer function is. So this means that we can turn our input that was in time into an input that's in the Laplace space. Um, and so then we just multiply the function we found by the transfer function. So that's step one. The next step today is to look at deviation from steady state. So those of you who've watched the videos, will know what I'm talking about. If you remember, the definition of the Laplace transform for dy by dt comes out to be s times our transformed function y bar of s minus y zero, the initial condition um, of our original function y. So if you're thinking about how do we get the transfer function gs, uh, we know that transfer function gs is likely to be involving differential terms. This term's easy enough to deal with. This term is a bit of an inconvenience. If we want to have um, generic expressions for a system, we don't want each expression to be different depending on what the initial condition happened to be um, on the particular case you're looking at. So 
the reason we do the deviation from steady state approach is that it gets rid of this. We take uh, the assumption that our pro process was at steady state before the um, disturbance. And so uh, then we look at uh, a new function, which is the deviation away from that steady state. So I'm going to call it Y star. In the notes, it's called Y dashed, but that could be a little confusing because that looks like the differential term. So we have our deviation term, and that's the difference between the actual value of Y and the steady state value of Y. So obviously, if we're looking at um, the initial condition where the process is at steady state, so therefore Y dashed of time zero is always going to be equal to zero. So that's the reason we do it, is it gets rid of that term and it makes our calculation of the transfer functions easier. Uh, likewise, you do the same for the input function. <clears throat> so the new input function, I'll put the times into those. The new input function is just the input function that it was before minus the steady state value that it was before. So this means that you can um, find the response. The response is then relative to what the steady state value was before, but that's something you'd know. And so then you can uh, see how the response is without having to recalculate each time. So that was the second point to make sure that you understood the concept of why we're doing that. And that's more fully explained in the, uh, in the mini videos. Okay, so those are two things we've done. So we've talked about the setting this up as the deviation to make sure we get a single transfer function that's true no matter what your initial condition was. We've talked about how you might calculate a value f of s for different types of input that actually happen in real life. And then the last thing we're going to look at in this uh, class is how do you find GS? So in many cases where we um, analyze a process, we can find GS by actual engineering analysis. We can come up with equations which we think are going to reasonably describe what's happening in a process. And then we can turn those equations using the Laplace transform into the transfer function. So there were some examples of this in the lectures. And this is one which um, I mentioned in the lecture but uh, didn't dwell on. So we're just going to look at this example and go through this to make sure that uh, you get the idea of that. I'll leave that there and I'm just going to draw it out with the main elements of it again. So this is a case where we've got a simple system where we have a tank full of liquid. Uh, so we've got a liquid in here, there's a volume V of liquid. The liquid has density rho and it has a specific heat capacity Cp. And this liquid is being affected by some heater. The heater has a liquid going into it at temperature Tw and we're going to call the temperature of the tank T. And the heater is going to have a heat transfer coefficient U, and it's going to have an area A. The example in the notes has a flow going through it, um, but that flow is actually part of the analysis in the notes, so uh, I'm not including that one. Simple tank, which can be heated up. So that's a, a case that is well within our capability to analyze. And what's the first thing we're going to do? The first thing is to make sure that we're working uh, in terms of the deviation from steady state. So we've got our parameters T and TW. So we want to write down what those are uh, as their deviations from steady state. So TW deviation is equal to TW minus TW steady state and T deviation is equal to T minus T steady state. So now it doesn't matter what the initial condition was, our analysis is going to be generally true. Next thing is to do an energy balance. We've got energy 
maybe coming in or going out through the coil. Uh, and we've got energy within the volume of the liquid itself. So we just want to balance those. So the energy in the volume of the liquid is going to be rho times the volume, so that's a mass times Cp, so that's an energy per mass. And then we multiply that by dt by d time. And that's going to be a power term. It's the change in energy per unit time as that's being heated up or cooled down. And that must balance the energy that's flowing through the heating coil. And that's going to be equal to the area times the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the temperature driving force, Tw minus T star. So simple enough, that's first year heat transfer, but it's enough to give us a transfer function that describes this process. So this is written in terms of time and it's written in terms of the deviation from steady state. And the next step is to do the Laplace transform. So we want to do the Laplace transform to this side and we want to do the Laplace transform to that side. Simple enough. These are all constant values, and so we know that uh, they can just be taken outside the Laplace transform. And then we've got a differential. And we know that the differential is equal to S times the Laplace transform. And just for completeness, we'll write in the initial condition term, but we've defined that to be zero. The platform transform this side, um, and again, that's straightforward because these functions are just on their own. So that's the Laplace transform of that. And I'll just write it out in full. That's the Laplace transform of that. So that was dead simple using our knowledge of what the Laplace transform of a differential term is, and um, because we've set the initial condition to be zero. And now we want to find the transfer function. And we can do that by looking for an expression for the output divided by the input. The input is Tw, that's the thing that's changing, changed to the system. And the output T is the uh, temperature of the tank, which is being affected. So we want an expression for T divided by Tw. So let's group up uh, our things for T on one side. So we've got V rho CPS times T, and then we're going to add UA. And that equals UA times TW. That's good, almost there. So output divided by input is now going to be equal to UA divided by all of this. Which is great. Uh, so that's our transfer function. And um, there we go, we've solved one. So that could be where you stop. You've got a function which describes how your system's going to behave. And then if you want to find out, so we call that G is equal to that. If you wanted to find out how your system responded to a change, if you knew what the change was. So if you have a step change in the temperature of the liquid flowing through the coil, or if they have a, great, a, a gradual, like a ramp change of Tw, you can find the Laplace transform of that, multiply it by G, and that will give it give you the uh, output function. So that's what you can do if you do the work each time. Um, but in the lecture, we also saw that there is some generality about these types of process. So any problem that starts off in this form is going to end up with an equation which looks a bit like that. And so in the mini lecture, you'll have seen the general case where we have a transfer function which is of the form 
something like kp over tau s plus one. kp is a constant, tau is a constant, and uh, this is the uh, general form of a transfer function for this type of differential problem. So you can see that hours can be written in that form. In our case, we just need to divide through by ua, and then we'd have kp is equal to one, and we'd have tau is equal to v rho cp divided by ua, like that. Um, and by doing that, we don't even need to go to the trouble of solving our inverse Laplace transform to know how the system is going to behave in certain cases because it's a very standard system. So for very standard systems, you will find that uh, solutions have already been presented for them. So for example, for this system, in response to a step change, So in response to a step change, this is the well-known response in the time domain. That's time divided by tau. So this tau is a characteristic time, which we call the time constant. And our response is going to go up and then flatten off and the asymptote of what it's flattening off to is equal to this term kp. So it doesn't matter what your system is, if it takes that form, you know that this is going to be how it responds to a step change, uh, a unit step change in, um, in well, sorry, any step change in input. And this has certain characteristics that we always know are true. So when we are at one time constant in time, so t divided by tau is equal to one, then we're going to be at uh, about 63% of our way to the final new steady state value. Uh, likewise, if you're two time constants away, you're going to be about 87% uh, of the way. So that's useful. So it means that for any system that has this initial form, you already know that if you can calculate its time constant, you can do quite a lot of uh, intuitive prediction about how it's going to behave to certain responses you know how quickly it will be uh, getting there. And um, so we can see what the meaning of this term is. Tau is a time constant. So once you know what that is, you know how that's going to be determining the speed of response of the system. So a small time constant, is going to give rise to very fast responses. A large time constant is gonna mean we have very slow responses to a step change. Then this term Kp, that's called the gain of the system. The gain is equal to the change in output divided by a change in input. So in our case, the gain is equal to one. Does that make sense? Well, let's say we've got uh, a tank at some temperature, 10 degrees to begin with. And to begin with, the fluid flowing around the coil is also at 10 degrees. So it's at steady state, everything's at 10 degrees. TW, temperature of the fluid changes to 20 degrees suddenly. So 20 degree fluid flows around here. The tank is going to start warming up and it's gonna warm up but it will warm up until the point where in the end it also is at 20 degrees. So then the tank is at 20 degrees, the feed is at 20 degrees, they're the same. So the gain is one, there's no increase in delta T here compared to the delta T here. However, a different system, if this temperature doubled when this temp temperature increased by a factor of one, that increased by a factor of two, um, then that would mean the gain would be equal to two and so on. So the gain is another characteristic of our system. It sort of tells us the sensitivity of it to, to change. So if the gain is high, it means a small change 
in uh, an input to the system is going to give rise to a large change in output. Sometimes that's good and sometimes it's bad. Um, it's good for many things where you're trying to amplify something, you're trying to make a small thing into a big thing. Um, but uh, also it means that if you have an output that you don't want to change, if you want your output to be steady, then you have to be careful when there are large gains because that means uh, obviously any small perturbations could give rise to significant deviations from your desired set point. Okay, so those are the main three points that I wanted to cover for the revision. I can see in the chat that there's some discussion about is it laggy and um, I don't know if it is or not. I can't tell from my side. Uh, I hope it's okay. So that's the example we've just done. I'm just going to uh, look through the remainder of the notes for this lecture too. Uh, this is another example. I'm not going to go through this one, uh, but it's another case of the same type of equation. So you can look at that yourself. Same type of equation. So you find oh, there we go. Same type of equation, so um, you'll find the same process. That's just what we've looked at, where we're looking at uh, kp and tau gain and time constant. The response looks identical for any system of that form. The response is identical. It will look like that. Uh, it's just a case of calculating what tau is and what kp is for your system, and then you know what the response is going to be. So the two characteristics are the time constant and the steady state gain. The gain determines sensitivity of the system and the time constant determines the response speed. And that's what we covered. As I said, the smaller the time constant, the steeper the initial response. For large gains, even small changes in the input result in large outputs. The steady state gain is what the change in output is at steady state compared to what the change in input, steady state input was. This gain is not time dependent and it only depends on process parameters and quantities. So looking back on this, we've seen how to describe things in the time domain, how to describe things in the Laplace domain. And um, I think the attraction of using the PLAS domain is starting to become apparent for this type of control problem. Um, so just to finish on, there are three types of problem and it's just helpful to identify uh, what we're doing with process control, what we're aiming to achieve and what we're not aiming to achieve uh, and where those other aspects lie. So in process control, that's what we're doing here. We have our inputs, we have our process model, we have our outputs. Uh, so typically in process control, we're dealing with cases where the process is known and we're dealing with situations where we know what the output, what we want it to be. We want the output to be a certain thing. It wants to be a certain concentration of product. It wants to be a certain temperature of product. It's something that we know we want. Um, and what we need to do is to cope with inputs. We need to accommodate unexpected changes in inputs due to external factors we're not controlling. Uh, and then we also need to decide which inputs we can use to help mitigate the change in other inputs. So that's what we're doing in process control. That's the sort of conception that we're dealing with. Um, but there are two other problems um, or, or approaches that uh, you'll encounter. Uh, so just to be clear, what we're not trying to do at the moment in this course is a simulation problem. So simulation is where you have inputs, a process model, and outputs. And really that's about where, well, we know what's gonna change for that inputs. We know what the process model is. Can we calculate everything that's going to happen to our output? And typically that would be done through integrating the process model. So that would be done by solving the differential equations themselves in the time space. Um, and that's what you do with programs like HiSys uh, and the like. Um, and that's good for, for what it's good for. It's good for looking at how the process changes um, as you're trying to do something with it or looking at uh, what outputs are you going to get? What concentration will you get given a given set of uh, model and input conditions? So simulation is different from process control. Uh, control is about typically a steady state process which then gets kicked by some change in input. And we're trying to see, well, how can we um, understand what that unexpected change will do to the outputs? 
and what else can we change on our inputs to try and mitigate that effect. Then the other way of looking at it, which we're not trying to do straight away, is the process identification problem. And that's the case where you know your inputs and you know your outputs and you're trying to work out what's happening within the process by considering these two things. So this is a case where you're not sitting down and thinking what equations are we going to use to describe the process. We're just doing an experiment, for example, we're changing some variables for our experiment. Um, we're then look, measuring the output from the experiment. And then we're thinking, well, what's happening in between? Uh, it might be an empirical model. We might be saying, oh, look, it looks like there's a power law relationship between these two things. Let's see if we can use that sort of equation to describe it. Um, or it might be some black box approach where we're not even trying to come up with a meaningful equation to describe it. And so neural networks, for example, have a way of doing that. So this conceptualization is, is the starting point for all three of those. Um, and the one that we're focusing on in process control is this one, where we're looking at perturbations to the system, given situations where typically we want the output to be constant. And we're thinking about well, what else can we change for our inputs then to mitigate that effect. Okay, so thank you very much for listening to that. So that will be uh, posted onto the Blackboard space along with the four videos that are already there for this week. Uh, next week, we're gonna move on to the uh, next topic in lecture three. And um, shortly over this week, I will post the videos and questions for next week so you can prepare in advance for that. We're going to uh, wrap this part up now and you'll move to the groups, uh, the same groups as last week. I have posted the group Uh, I've posted the group um, Zoom addresses, uh, Zoom meeting details, uh, both uh, in an email to you this morning and in on the Blackboard page. So you can find them in those two places. So if you want to start leaving this meeting um, and making your way over there, then, uh, then you'll pick up with your demonstrators and they will talk you through the um, problems that were set for this week, which are all examples of practicing the Laplace transform. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Email questions um, or post them onto the discussion board on the module Blackboard page, and we will respond to those promptly. Thank you.